Morning, everybody. Mike's okay? So, Jonathan, um, I'm going to try to frame up this conversation by reading some statistics which come from your organization. So, in the last uh, two weeks, we have tripled the number of anti-Semitic incidents. Um, we had 213 compared to 64 last year. Um, this is more than a matter of anti-Semitism. The Council on uh, American Islamic Relations said it had 774 complaints on Islamophobic behavior in the same period. Uh, 200, uh, 2022 saw the highest ever number of recorded hate crimes, 11,600 since the FBI began collecting statistics. Um, in fact, the majority of hate crimes had to do with African Americans in 2022. Uh, Anti-LGBTQ hate crimes jumped 20% last year. Um, among Latinos, um, we saw a 41% increase last year. Um, for anti-Asian hate crimes, 150% uh, increase from 2020. Kung flu, you remember all those lovely phrases. Um, so I want you to tell us what you see causing this rise in intolerance, this rise in hate speech, this rise in America turning on itself? So I'll answer the question. And first, I'll just thank Paul for the nice introduction and all of you for coming out this morning. I understand that, the, there, that uh, yesterday was a very intense day. And as Paul said, that uh, this is a group with insatiable curiosity that gets very thirsty after hours. So I'm sure you were all out late last night. So thank you for showing up for this morning session. <clears throat> um, Richard, I mean, I think there is no question that right now we are dealing with a sort of tsunami of hate. And I think there are three main factors that are driving it. The first factor, I think, is sort of the coarsening of the public conversation. And I think this really started in earnest in 2016 when Donald Trump ran for president. Now, I'm going to say right, up, right now, up front, ADL, we're a nonpartisan, apolitical, tax-exempt organization. I don't really care how you vote. What I focus on is what you value. And I think that's what's important here. But I say that because there's no doubt that when President Trump ran, that he started saying things and tweeting things and sharing things that we've never seen before from a serious presidential candidate. Never. George Wallace, Pat Buchanan, these were not serious presidential candidates. Lyndon LaRouche, these are not serious presidential candidates. Uh, he was, and of course he won the nomination and then he won the general. And from the things he said about Muslims, about Mexicans, his tweets like with Jewish stars and America First and his ads and on and on and on. I think he coarsened the conversation. And then, of course, when he came into office, he turned a lot of those, that rhetoric into policy. And when he was saying things on the campaign trail, it was one thing. When he was saying it from the bully pulp of the Oval Office, it was entirely different, a lot more consequential. And you know, on election day was such a shocking day, 2016, the day after, we saw a huge spike in anti-Semitic incidents and other kinds of hate crimes. So, I'll also just say that as we learn from Isaac Newton, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And as President Trump coarsened things uh, with, a, if you will, an, uh, around, I would say, kind of right-wing extremism, we've seen hard left extremism normalized as well. And look, we're seeing it on these college campuses. We're irrespective of the assault that happened yesterday at NYU, or the stabbing that happened on Friday at UMass Amherst, or the case of a assault that happened at Harvard, or the Cooper Union, or the death threats at Cornell, I could go on and on. Jewish students, and if you don't believe me, go ask them, will tell you about the microaggressions and the macroaggressions they face every day. So number one, I think the public conversation has coarsened. And the, the dialogue has dim, diminished. Number two, extremists feel emboldened. 
and it contributes to the coarsening. You see it in the Marjorie Taylor Greens and the Paul Gosars. You see it in the Rashida Tlaibs and Cori Bush. Like extremists feel emboldened, they're running for office, not just at the federal level, of course, at the state and local level. We're tracking Proud Boys and Oath Keepers running for school boards and library commissions. So you have extremists, I would say, in some newsrooms, in some CSR departments. Extremists feel emboldened in an environment where they're not being beat back. So number one, number one, coarsening of the conversation, the highest levels. Number two, extremists feeling emboldened. And then number three, social media, from Twitter to TikTok, you know, from Instagram to Snap, from YouTube to Facebook. Social media is a super spreader of hate. And social media, look, it, it dulls the edges of society, I think, and diminishes our collective intelligence by reducing everything to 280 characters or to a 15 second video. And so there's no more room for nuance. And if it bleeds, it leads, uh, they say, right? And like on Twitter or on TikTok, you know, if it hemorrhages, right, it rises right to the top. So the algorithms are designed to get your dopamine going, and they deliver on that, and to the point where I think all of us suffer as a result. So Jonathan, we had uh, 1,400 uh, people murdered in uh, Israel. Um, subsequently, we've seen 10,000 Palestinians killed in the reprisals by Israel. Um, where do you see this going? What does it mean for, and, and why is anti-Semitism linked to the conflict in Israel? That's a good question. So in terms of where it's going, I mean, I'm not a, you know, a general, military general or something like that. I'm not a geopolitical strategist. But I do think based on my conversations with folks in Israel and having observed this kinds of issues for a number of years, I think the Israelis simply can't afford to allow Hamas to continue to operate as it has with impunity in the Gaza Strip. Because the Hamas leadership has said October 7th was a glorious win, and they're gonna keep doing October 7th again and again and again and again. They've been very open about that. Their charter calls not for a two-state solution. Their charter doesn't call for a one-state solution. Their charter literally calls for a final solution. Right, their goal is not to create a Palestinian state. The charter says the goal is to destroy the state of Israel, or the Zionist entity, as they call it. So I think Israel is in a situation where they just can't allow that group, which is a terror group, according to the State Department. It is a hate group, based on what they say. It's also the government of Gaza. They're going to have to dislodge them, dismantle them in some capacity. Now, anti-Semitism rears its head here because you see Jewish people being held collectively responsible by people here and around the world for what's happening in Israel. And look, this is classic, this is classic stereotyping. I mean, you were talking earlier about, let's say, anti-Asian hate. And you can be very upset about the Beijing's policies toward the Uyghurs. You can be very upset about Beijing's policies towards democracy activists in Hong Kong. You can be very upset about the way Beijing handled COVID-19. That is not an excuse to harass, to target, to victimize Chinese Americans or AAPIs of any kind. That is not an excuse to like vandalize Chinese restaurants. That is not an excuse to attack Chinese students. I mean, that's prejudice, that's racism. And attacking Harvard students on a college camp, sorry, Jewish students or Israeli students on a college campus uh, or out in public is racism. It's anti-Semitism, it's hate. But I think you know, throughout history we've seen Jews blamed for having, quote, dual loyalty because Jews lived as a minority in other countries. We've seen Jews you know, described as illegitimate. The Jews, Judaism is an illegitimate religion. Jewish people are an illegitimate people. And now we see people say Israel is an illegitimate state. It's many of the classic, historic, anti-Semitic myths have gone from being imposed upon Jewish people to now they're imposed upon the Jewish state. So you're trained as a lawyer. Um, you have very strong views about uh, freedom of speech. 
to you, what is the limit of freedom of speech? And in particular, please describe in your mind what an optimal position for a university president would be. Mm. So one thing, like I'm not a lawyer. That's very germane because I'm an MBA, but I do run one of the oldest civil rights organizations in the United States. The ADL is older than the ACLU. And we've been fighting for the First Amendment for 110 years. And I think the First Amendment is pivotal to the privileges all of us enjoy here. The right to worship as you choose, the right to assemble as you choose, the freedom of uh, the, the separation of church and state, and of course, the right to free speech. But where you run up against the right to free speech is the freedom of speech is not the freedom to slander people. Right? Slander is not okay. Freedom of expression is great, but that's not the freedom to incite violence against people, to threaten their person, or to imperil them. That is also not okay. Slander and incitement to violence, when I say they're not okay, that's not my view, that's the Supreme Court's view. And you can't yell, you can't cry fire in a crowded theater. You can't do that, again, not Jonathan's view, the Supreme Court's view. So I will acknowledge that sometimes these issues might seem hard. Like from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. I understand in the abstract that sounds fine. But to Jewish people, Palestine will be free from the river to the sea. That's like Germany for Germans. That was a slogan used by the Nazis in the mid-1930s. Now in an abstract, that's fine. Germany for Germans sounds great. Until you understand that what they are suggesting there is Germany, not for Jews. And Palestine will be free from the river to the sea is an eliminationist phrase, no matter what Congresswoman Tlaib says, that's intended to suggest no Jews there. So now if I'm a college president and someone says that, yeah, I get the freedom of speech issues are hard, they are difficult, they are complicated. I'm not gonna oversimplify it here today. But what I will say is every university, including Harvard, has a code of conduct. Every university has an honor code. And if you've seen the videos of Jewish students or Israeli students being screamed at, being shouted down, being harassed, being victimized, uh, I don't, at the risk of stating the obvious, the students conducting such activities are violating, typically, the honor code or the code of conduct of those institutions. So you have your right to free speech until you abridge somebody else's right to free speech. That's where it ends. And I think the fact that so many university presidents are unwilling to say that, that they are unwilling to call it out, that they are unwilling to put their foot down, is why we're in this situation today. And look, I've called out President Trump, and I've called out, you know, President Gay at Harvard, and I've called out, I called the president of the local PTA. People in positions of authority need to be accountable to, again, a shared set of values. Leaders need to lead. And leadership means not just doing what the masses want you to do, not just following the majority, but protecting the minority, be they Jewish or non-Jewish, be they African American or not, be they LGBTQ or straight. And I think so often our uh, leadership has dithered, Richard, which is why we're in this fix. Okay, so a lot of the people in the audience are either advising companies or in companies. So what in your mind is the right playbook for a CEO? Speak yeah. up, don't speak up. If you speak up, um, how often? And is there, is there more that um, you should do than speak up? Is there a certain set of actions that you as the CEO should lead? Well, and I talk to lots of CEOs. So first of all, full disclosure, I was a senior executive at Starbucks, uh, you know, in an earlier life. And I was a senior executive at a company called Realtor.com in an earlier life that's now owned by News Corp. Um, 
So I've been on that side of the table, so to speak. So number one for the CEO. You could be like, uh, what's his name? Uh, Brian Armstrong from Coinbase. Some of you may have seen his very famous letter where he said, all we're doing is crypto. No positions, no issues. If you don't like it, you can leave. So that's one approach. I don't take a position on anything. Okay. But if you as a CEO are taking positions and you took a position on Black Lives Matter or you took a position on AAPI hate, it is very, or time's up. And by the way, those are all valid to do. I'm not questioning that. It, though it is very hard when you, when, you aren't, when you are inconsistent with your integrity. If you took a position on those issues and you're not taking a position on the flagrant anti-Semitism, and you, I mean the numbers that Richard shared, it's even worse than those numbers. 2022 was the worst year that the ADL has ever tracked for anti-Semitic incidents in this country. It was 36% higher than the year before. So I'm telling you that we were at more than a 500% increase of acts of harassment, vandalism, and violence before October the 7th. Since October the 7th, it's gone up another 388%. So if you speak out about anti-black racism and you speak out about AAPI hate, you gotta speak out about anti-Semitism. And then in terms of the situation in Israel, look, if you spoke out about Ukraine, it's hard not to say anything here. 1,400 people were massacred. And there is nothing wrong with saying the massacre of 1,400 people, babies and children and women and grandmothers and all of it, that's despicable, period, full stop. Then you can say, I also deplore, you know, the civilians who are getting killed in Gaza. Now, I would argue that Gaza is an open-air prison and the warden is Hamas. I would argue that, that Gaza is occupied and the occupier is Hamas. That has been squelching the rights of their own people for 17 years. And we, we, we can have that conversation if you want, but I would say irrespective of Hamas, innocent Palestinians getting killed and every innocent life that's lost is a tragedy. And we need to have the humanity to recognize that Palestinians deserve dignity and equality too. And that isn't anti-Semitic to say that. It's human to say that. So I think there's a way for CEOs, A, if you spoke out about other domestic issues, you gotta be consistent and call out anti-Semitism. And then B, if you speak out about global issues, you can say something about the loss of innocent lives in Gaza as well as Israel. And you can do it in a way that is reasonable and is balanced and again, is decent and human because that's the right thing to do. So Jonathan, I want to clarify one point, which is at breakfast you told me that you agreed with me about a two-state solution. I do. You agree further that uh, settlements should be contained. I absolutely um, do. And that in fact um, we need to find a way to a peaceful coexistence. A hundred percent. Like I think Israelis will not have safety and security until Palestinians also have a degree of dignity and equality. And, and by the way, Palestinians will only get dignity and equality if Israelis have safety and security. It isn't either or, it's both and. So like the calls for a ceasefire, they make sense to me after the hostages are returned and Hamas agrees to lay down its arms and negotiate a peace deal. That makes sense to me. That would stop this madness. A ceasefire without stopping the madness is just a recipe for long-term conflict. So Jonathan, our research on trust indicates that the number one thing that employees want at the moment is comfort, a place for grieving, a place to talk, because in fact the workplace is the number one safe place, not the neighborhood. Yeah. Which is a big change. Yeah. So, that's a very big expectation for employers. And because employers are the most trusted institution, what do you specifically recommend that companies do for Jewish employees, Arab Americans, you know, a whole range? Well, I think one of the things you're pointing out now is something I think that all of you have to grapple with as you advise chief executives and corporations. Cynicism is so high today. Distrust of government, 
distrust of the judiciary, distrust of politicians, distrust of the media, distrust of organized religion, distrust of all those institutions which for so long have held up this country. To your point, business is now the most trusted sector, if you will. And so again, I appreciate that for the chief executive, that's complicated, because you thought you were here to drive EPS and now you, or ROI, and now you're here to like make your employees feel safe. Not easy to do. Um, now that being said, I don't, I don't know that I'm the right person to speak to what do you have to do to make your Muslim employees feel safe. But I will say like at ADL, we do believe, and we have something called, this is something you ought to take note of, we created something called the Workplace Pledge to make it easy for CEOs to stand with their Jewish employees. And it's pretty simple. And I think the lessons of it could apply to any community. Number one, if you have ERGs, you know, employee resource groups or employee affinity groups, and your Jewish employees want one, support it. Now, I had one chief HR officer from a very large employer say to me, we don't do that because we don't have ERGs for religion. Well, you know what? Too bad. If your Jewish employees want one, and you do it for your black employees, your Asian employees, your Latino employees, your Jewish employees, you should do it for your Jewish employees too. Because by the way, you have Jewish people who say, I'm Jewish, but I'm an atheist. I'm Jewish, but I'm cultural. I'm Jewish, but I've never been to synagogue. Because Jewish is com complicated. It's not just a religion, it's also sort of an ethnicity. So number one, if you have a Jewish ERG, if your employees want to support it. Number two, if you have DEI training for your employees, make sure it includes anti-Semitism. Now, many of them don't. Many DEI programs focus on anti-racism. They focus on you know, dealing with issues of homophobia and transphobia. We think it's important that it encompass anti-Semitism too. The hate crimes alone are enough of a reason why. And then number three, if your Jewish employees want a religious accommodation, like I want to take the day off to go for, for Jewish services for Rosh Hashanah. Let them. By the way, I think the Supreme Court says you need to do that anyways. But so in my mind, our workplace pledge at ADL, they sign up, you sign up and you say, I'll support a Jewish ERG if my people want it. If we do DEI, we'll include anti-Semitism. We'll give them a religious accommodation. We already have hundreds of companies who've signed on like Google, Adidas, KKR, Omnicom, CAA, J. Crew. Made well, the MBA, NASCAR, like a lot of companies. That's an easy bar. So again, if you're advising corporations, you're advising CEOs, making sure that employees uh, who need one have an ERG, easy. Make sure if you have DEI, it's comprehensive, easy. Make sure employees who need an accommodation, whether it's for Juneteenth or for Rosh Hashanah, give it to them. This is a pretty low bar, folks, that anyone should be able to meet. So we take a slightly different view, which is we have a faith ERG, and it has, you know, Buddhists and Jews and But what Muslims if your Jewish employees and your Muslim employees or your Buddhist employees, your Catholic employees, your Mormon employees have different needs? How would you deal with that? Like the Mormon employees may have been feeling about abortion that isn't shared by, say, I don't know, the Buddhist employees. How do you deal with that? I think we have to be able to have these discussions. We have to be able to debate it and have a, okay, we disagree on this. Um, I don't know that <clears throat> we come to, even within the Jewish one, I'm not sure you get to unanimity. <laughs> Just to say. The Jews, they are Five Jews, lot. four political parties. Yeah, I mean, look, it's, I mean, there's something about it. I mean, you can have an approach that's ecumenical, where you try to bring them all together. You may have to have an approach that's a bit more sectarian. You allow people to have their own lanes. I don't know that there's a one way to do it, but we recommend Again, in this moment when Jewish people are dealing with all the issues we were talking about a few minutes ago, we, you accommodate for them. So I want to talk to you about the information wars. Um, you've spent a lot of time at ADL um, calling out hate speech. Um, you've called yes. out specific platforms yes. um, as being insufficient with moderation. I'd like you to talk more about that and what you see at the moment in the social platforms. Yeah, so ADL, you know, like I said, we've been focused on fighting hate for over 100 years. Today, again, the main vector, the main vector for prejudice is social media. I don't think I'm telling you anything you don't know. Um, so we set up a Center for Technology and Society back in 2017. I have an ex-Facebook executive running it. 
And so we deal with these issues of, and we work with all the platforms. By the way, here's a, something to note. Social media is not the only problem. You should be thinking about advising your clients in online gaming. Gaming is huge. And even if you folks don't play Candy Crush, when you're on the subway or whatever, like hundreds and hundreds of millions of people do. And all of your kids or your grandkids <clears throat> are playing or ha have played or are playing Roblox or Fortnite or whatever it may be. And I think this is very material because we see uh, online gaming as complicated, messaging apps, e-commerce services, and the emerging world of artificial and virtual reality. So we're looking at all of this. Uh, look, I think on the one hand, Richard, free, uh, hate speech is the price of free speech. You have to be willing to see things that we don't like, that we detest. But you also, in an online environment, look, the truth is, is that this stuff should not be algorithmically amplified. And the company should enforce their own terms of service. So a few years ago, you, I know we talked, much, we talked a lot at the time, when ADL organized this big campaign against Facebook. Some of you may remember it. It was called <coughs> Stop Hate for Profit. We brought in the NAACP, Color of Change, LULAC, other civil rights groups. When Facebook was unwilling after the death of George Floyd to deal with white supremacists on their platform. We took them on. We called for companies to get off the platform and not advertise for the month of July. We started out with no companies lined up. Within a couple weeks, we had well over 1,000 of the biggest brands in the world. Coca-Cola, Disney, McDonald's, VW, Unilever, Starbucks, so many more, Levi's, Hershey, so many. And you know, look, that pushed Facebook to finally change. We got them to classify white supremacy as hate speech, to take off the bad actors. We got them to classify Holocaust denialism as hate speech, take it off. We got them to hire a VP of civil rights. We really made an impact. And look, we've gone toe to toe with uh, the new leadership at X slash Twitter. I, I'm not gonna admit, he who shall not be named. <laughs> um, and that's been a challenging, it's been a sled, <laughs> Reich. Uh, he's a little less receptive, I would say. Because his theory is that um, the public can distinguish between that which is true and that which is false. Well, yeah, but he also replatformed some of the worst actors who previously had taken off. He also fired everyone on the trust and safety team. He also fired everyone in the election integrity team. He also changed the way they verify accounts. So now you get a blue check, not if you're actually a legitimate voice, but if you're willing to pay $8 a month. I think they call that payola. So it's a very different ball game. And I think, look, the, engage, the, the engagement on Twitter, or X, reflects the changes. X is a less utilized platform today than it was two years ago. X is a less, it brings in a lot less advertising revenue than it did two years ago. And I think it's a lot less of a trusted source than it is two years ago. Not my opinion. Like, you can look at the data, you can look at the stats and draw your own conclusions. But if you're a communicator and you see falsehoods on platforms, you have to intervene. And you need to be assertive and uh, you need to have multiple voices make the case. Well, this is a good point, like, and this is a learning for me. I mean, uh, what I remember learning in comms is that when someone says something that's untrue online, just ignore it. Ignore it. Let it go away. That doesn't work. That does not work. Someone throws something up against you, you hope it goes away. Guess what, it never does. It stays floating in the ether to be retweeted and repeated by all kinds of crazies. So I do think that whereas my view was once, let it go, like a, like a Disney movie, uh, now I think you actually have to take it on. And you're better off countering the, the slander and pushing back against the lies rather than thinking it's beneath you to respond to them. The trick is, how do you respond? Because it's hard. If you respond head on, you can dignify what's undignified. You can give oxygen to what you want to put out. So you have to be clever in how you do this so you can, you can push back and yet not inadvertently promote, promote the lies. 
And Jonathan, do you have advice to the communicators in the audience about um, time? Um, because a lie gets traction, and it seems to move from deep web to you know platform to mainstream. Yeah, I mean, it's look. It is you guys have some of the hardest jobs. I mean, I think your job has become <clears throat> infinitely more difficult today than it was just a few years ago. Because you have to play this multi-dimensional chess. And you have to be wicked effective at responding to things, which means you have to have a monitoring capability that enables you a degree of vigilance you didn't used to have before. So what there's software tools that you can use to, mo to listen and monitor to your brands. <clears throat> and then you also have to have a proactive capability to tell a story, and look, we were talking earlier about trust. I mean, here's the crazy thing, right? As cynicism has grown and trust has fallen in like the media, so who do people trust today? Who do young people trust today? Influencers. What's the main criteria it would seem for influencers? Authenticity. What does authenticity mean? I don't know. It typically means like you don't have experience. Really? Or you don't have like a classic education. You just have popularity. So popularity uh, is actually, in my opinion, not a substitute for experience or wisdom or even smarts. Um, but I think what's complicated for you is you tell your stories and as you try to drive a narrative, you can no longer rely on the traditional institutional approach. You have to think about kind of a bottoms-up, influencer-driven approach. Because those are the means by which, particularly like an 18 to 24, 24 to 32 year old demographic gets their information today. I mean, I can almost say with certainty, guys, like those of you who have kids, let's say, or those of you who are younger than 25, I'll bet you if you ask, and at the difference between someone who's like, let's say 30 and younger versus 31 and older. If you're 30 and younger and you ask someone, what time is like, if you're 31 and older, here's a question. Let's just do a, a, a thing, okay? Bill Maher, real time, HBO. Do you know when it's on? Raise your hand if you know what day of the week it's on, HBO, and what time it's on. Raise your hand if you know. Really, am I like, there's only two people in the audience? Three, four? Now, when, now if you don't know what time it's on, what, do you know what channel it's on? Okay, pretty much everybody. I can't believe nobody knows what channel it's on. And if you're 20, 30 and younger, do you know what time Bill Maher is on? If you're 30 or younger, do you know what channel Bill Maher is on? You are not younger than 30, <laughs> young man. I mean, this is the truth. Like, young people today don't watch anything. What do they call it? Destination viewing or something like that? Linear viewing? Like, there's a youngish crowd in front. Like, do you ever go to the television at a particular time and turn on a channel? Would you ever think of doing that? My kids laugh at me when I say, hey, where's the clicker? My kids think I'm like from outer space. So, so I say so this just because <clears throat> linear storytelling is dead. But John, it's more than that. It's, if you're in crisis comms, you have to not just wait for debunking stories, you have to pre-bunk stories. Important right. theory. You have to <clears throat> think about where the attacks are coming from and then establish certain experts in advance and have facts out there that undermine the thesis. And I think the Ukrainians did a superb job of this on the rationale for the Russian invasion. Yeah. Because the Russians are like, well, we're coming to reclaim our long lost territories because everybody speaks Russian here. And the Ukrainians said, sorry, not so. We don't want to be invaded. They're about to invade us. And that was pre-bunking. And it's a perfect example. Yeah, I haven't heard that term pre-bunking before, but it's true. Use it. It's good in pitches. <laughs> Gail, we'll let you use it. It's good. It's a good one. <laughs> no, but the, the key point is don't sit and wait. You can uh, hit your opponent a little before they hit you. It's, it's a smart idea. Jonathan, how do you conduct your own PR? How do you look at yourself as a leader, how much media is the right amount? What are you thinking about um, your positioning as, as a guy who's, God knows, the last three weeks you've been Mr. On Air? Yeah, it's funny. Um, so 
I would not have expected to be in the role that I am. I mean, the head of the ADL historically, like my predecessor was a guy named Abe Foxman. Hmm. He was a spokesperson on issues of anti-Semitism. I, I, I came into ADL thinking I was gonna run the organization like a business, because that's how I, what I knew how to do. And yet, the week I started on the job was the week that Donald Trump announced his candidacy. And it was like the wheels came off. And so whereas I wanted to be a CEO who was focused down on running my organization, I quickly became a CEO who was focused out on telling a story and representing a point of view and speaking out like against the Muslim ban and all his other lunacy. So it's funny, like I don't know that I get credit for some master plan on PR, but what I have tried to do in moments is communicate a clear and cogent message is to speak, again, in short, smart sound bites and to always go in prepared. So I think tactically I do okay, which is why I get asked back. I think strategically, I don't think I get credit for some master plan because I don't really have one. But what I've tried to do with ADL, I will say, is whereas I think when my predecessor ran it, it was much more parochially focused on the Jewish community, by speaking out against the Muslim ban, which was despicable, so it wasn't hard to do. And by speaking out against his, like the president's slandering of Latino people, and by speaking out in support of uh, the African American community, and speaking out against anti-Asian hate, and speaking out against anti-LGBTQ bias, like suddenly I think ADL has been able to reestablish itself as a voice against all forms of hate. So that when I talk about anti-Semitism, I think I have more credibility because I've been willing to stick my neck out for other communities. Now again, like I don't know that there's so much credit for that. I think it's just the right thing to do, but I think it's helped my case. So I guess to answer your question, by taking the long view, by trying to be taking a universal approach, I think it's allowed me to be more effective advocating for my own community. And some part of your communication strategy when there's not a crisis is also intellectual property. So you will do oh, yeah. studies and keep yeah, the- That's a great point. So I mean, at eight, like I've tried to productize ADL. So we move from just rapid response to being proactive. Instead of having programs, we have products. And we have research products and we think about them as tent poles. So every year we do a, a domestic um, audit of anti-Semitic incidents. We collect all the incident data and we build a whole comm strategy around releasing it. And then I take that comm strategy and then I, 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 I um, break it up so it's a national audit. And now we do state reports, hate in the sunshine state for Florida, hate in the you know, uh, empire state for New York. And we make it relevant in local markets which helps with our ability to get local press. So we have annual domestic, we have annual global, Again, ten we have an annual report of online hate. So these tent poles create pivot points all throughout the year. And then we try to break it up to have regional press around that too. So I'm just gonna get a quick show of hands in the uh, audience. How many of you serve on nonprofit boards? That's great. And of those of you who don't, is it because you are young and don't have the money yet to afford the board seat and all that? So raise your hands if you want to in the future. Just so I, okay. I have to say, there's never been a more important time for all of you to sit on nonprofit boards because people like Jonathan need advice. They need, um, okay, we have a crisis. What do we do? Um, we have opportunities, which media to speak to. And so please do it. In short, I mean, I, I'm no hero, but I'm sitting on eight now because I can't say no <laughs> more than anything. But I, I feel really good about it, and and I think you know, it's our responsibility to do it. Yeah, and I would. Can I just build upon what Richard's saying? Like, it's about more than money. Like people like me, we need thirty somethings and younger to help us understand, like again, how to navigate the new communications landscape, how to tell stories in a nonlinear environment, and so. Don't doubt what you bring to the table. And even if you can't write a big check, you can raise your hand and volunteer, and say, hey, I think I can help. And so there may be ways to get involved before you're on the board of directors, where you can be a hyper-engaged volunteer and work your way up. Trade off on your skills, if you will, 
trade up, trade, I mean, use your skills to trade up, even if you don't have, you know, the checking account yet to pay the bills. Jonathan, the one thing that you didn't talk about in your sort of first three explanations of why this rise in hate is yeah. the mass class divide. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And in our trust data, you see a hmm, 20 plus point delta between the bottom 25% and the top 25% of income. The top 25% think institutions are doing great. The bottom 25% since 2008 recession has been flatlined. So zero recovery fairly well. So do you think that this kind of anger is partly, gee, I'm doing worse economically. Um, I, you know, I've lost my job to China. I am feeling downwardly mobile. I don't have enough money. There's inflation. I'm pissed. No, I think, you're, I think it's a very good point. If we think about why did Trump win in 2016, this guy with no political experience, let alone his like, you know, gold, gold, bathrooms and whatever. I think it is because he exploited this divide. You know, my friend Mo Alifi, who's a political scientist over at Georgetown, he says, our country doesn't have a right-left problem. Our country has a front-of-the-line, back-of-the-line problem. People who are in the front of the line want to stay there. People at the back of the line are trying to figure out how to get there and are frustrated that they can't. And it speaks to this mass class problem. Um, we do know that in moments of economic stress, when people feel like their opportunities are, are limited and constrained, they often look for someone to blame. Scapegoats. So when President Trump talked about the Mexicans and the Muslims and George Soros and replacement theory, that touched a nerve. Because a lot of people feel like, hey, why am I not getting a break? Why am I earning less than my parents? That plant closed. I have the, you know, the, the, that store closed. I have less opportunities than, I, than the previous generations. And that sense of grievance that he fed is very strong. And look, after 2008, when no one from the banking industry went to jail, that kind of fed a narrative that the deck was stacked against normal people. I understand that. And I do worry, I, I say specifically as it relates to anti-Semitism, like anti-Semitism thrives in environments where people feel disgruntled, where people feel disaffected. And again, a leader looks to blame the Jews to avoid taking responsibility themselves. So in the protest march that went in front of my apartment in New York 10 days ago about Palestine will be free from the river to the sea, I was out walking my dog, of course, just by chance. And so what I observed what kind of in the group, what kind of dog you he's the greatest. He, he's, he's a part poodle and he's a part golden retriever. Oh, that's nice. And he's my man. Um, I call him the, I, he's the winger. What's his anyway, name? Archie. Archie. Like the comic. Like anyway, the subject. So I looked at the audience. I have a cookie. Okay. We can fix them up. Golden doodle. Oh, okay. Girl or boy? Girl. A shidduch. Okay. <laughs> Baby is soon. Okay. So the question, Jonathan, is I looked at the marchers and a lot of them were young. They were college students, mostly white, um, and that's what I saw. Um, and they seemed, they, they hey, you and I talked about this this morning, is this anti-business, is it anti-capitalism, is it, you know, anti-establishment, you know, listen, 50 years ago, people were marching on Vietnam. I mean, you know, what is it? Well, look, I mean, I don't, know if, I don't know that that march was necessarily a representative sample set, yeah. but I do think that there is a line from Occupy Wall Street mm -hmm. that runs through this moment where there, is peop there are people, actually go back like to the WTO protests in Seattle, the anti-globalization protests, to Occupy, to where we are today. People feel disaffected. They feel like they don't have the opportunity at the ballot box to express themselves adequately. I think sometimes the crowd can be more radical than their elected representatives, and they feel the surge. Now, what's funny is like, you may have seen, or some of you may have seen the video of this construction worker in Queens who confronted this person who was tearing the posters of hostages off the wall. If you haven't seen it, there are these posters of hostages being held in Gaza. 
And I mean, look, like, again, you can have strong views on the Middle East conflict, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but like, these hostages are babies and infants and elderly people. Yeah. These are mothers and fathers who saw their children executed in front of them by Hamas, or children whose parents were executed in front of them. So like, I think tearing down the posters of hostages is pretty despicable, pretty gross. Anyways, some guy was doing it and this construction worker from Queens like, got in the guy's face and yelled at him. And it was really quite amazing. And it reminds us again that this mass class thing is real. And that these very, sometimes I think people who are very elite and up in the clouds have one point of view and ordinary people don't necessarily share that. And that guy, he was not some Israeli no. IDF veteran. He was just an ordinary construction worker who saw there was something very indecent about what this person was doing and it touched a nerve. So we have about 14 minutes left in the conversation. I wanna bring in the audience because I've asked all the questions. We have a lot of smart people here. So Is there let's, a let's start with young people, come on. There's a question back there from a youngish person. I can't really see you, but I just see a hand. You, you feel youngish. Hi, I know you mentioned... Um, What's your name, ma'am? Sarah. Sarah. Nice to meet you. Thanks for speaking. Um, I know you mentioned social media as a source of um, the spread of disinformation and of outrage and outrage machine. Um, sh besides creating legislation to, um, you know, make social media companies change the algorithms and change what they share, how would you recommend um, combating disinformation spread on social media? Well, I think, again, I think regulatory pressure, Sarah, would be the best way to combat the spread of disinformation. I mean, these companies, again, all of you in PR for years learned, and you know, that television stations and newspaper and magazine publishers, they have certain laws that prevent them from publishing libel or slander. Like, the social media companies are exempt from that rule, that law, it's ridiculous. But absent that change, what can you do? I think reputational pressure, revenue pressure, and uh, shareholder pressure. So revenue pressure is talk to your advertisers and pull your ads from platforms that are gonna put your brand up alongside lies. It's not exactly good for your brand. If it's being advertised next to horrible Hamas, pro-Hamas content or pro-KKK content. Secondly, reputational pressure. Like, again, nothing's been more effective than the grassroots pressure against brands that get it wrong. And those kind of campaigns can be organized. And then thirdly, shareholder pressure. Like, you can, people can buy shares and show up at the meeting and really embarrass the leadership. Now the challenge with companies like Twitter is private, Reddit is private, companies like Google, which owns, or Alphabet, which owns Google and YouTube, or Meta, which owns Facebook and Insta, or Snap, they have share structures, so the voting shares, all the power is with the original founder. So they're a little bit less uh, vulnerable to shareholder pressure, but nonetheless, you can still make a lot of noise in a shareholder meeting and create problems. So those are the three levers I think you can pull. Sir. Hi, Phil Kaplan. Um, oh. Hi, Phil Kaplan. Um, where does it all end up? I don't mean, you know, in the Middle East, but culturally speaking, you know, what, what does the future hold for us all as individuals on the street? That's a good question, Phil. Like, it's a big question. Um, <laughs> look, I really think, I was hoping that President Biden would be sort of the post-political leader who could bring together the right and the left. I think this country desperately needs that. I worry a great deal about who the next president will be in 2025, let's say. Because if it is a divisive figure, I think it would be deeply damaging to America and to our sense of cohesion. So I don't know where we end up necessarily, but I do believe that a divisive national leader could be terribly damaging to the country's very fragile sense of cohesion. So I think the stakes are high. I mean, I wrote a book last year called it could happen here. That was focused on the fact that, you know, I'm a grandson of a Holocaust survivor from Germany who thought Germany was the greatest country in the world until it turned on him and 
turned him into an enemy of the state and killed everyone that he ever loved, and he came here. And I'm the husband of a political refugee from Iran. And you know, my wife's Jewish from Iran, and they thought Iran was the best country in the world until it turned on them, regarded them as enemies of the state, and destroyed everything they ever loved and forced them to come here. So Iran was a great country before it wasn't. And Germany was a great country until it wasn't. Like, don't think that America will always be what we want it to be if we don't fight for what we have. That's really the lesson. We've got to fight to keep the privileges and rights that we enjoy intact. So I just had a couple of thoughts for people in the audience. One, we have to make sure that our clients are encouraging people to vote next year, that they're registered here, here. and that they get out. You should all clap for that. Like, that's the best thing I've heard okay. today. The second is that you'll find this stunning, but a company newsletter is the most credible source of information uh, today not mainstream, and certainly not social media. So I'm not suggesting that your companies put out political data, be clear. However, if it's about public health or if it's about, you know, during the pandemic, for instance, was the vaccine safe or not? Very important. So trade up your level of focus on your, on your company newsletter. Um, and the last is, Make sure that your CEO understands that in the event of a contested election or something, um, last time it was really important that uh, 30 or 40 CEOs uh, the second week of November said, uh, this election will stand. The, the, the people have spoken and uh, the House is gonna need to vote um, the electors. Um, so cut it out. And I'm not saying that you should be voting rights bill advocates and all that stuff, but, um, if it comes down to a matter of having a functioning society, companies have a major stake in making sure that happens. Here, here. There's a question over here. Go ahead, just start. Uh, you mentioned earlier. Uh, What's your name, sir? Oh, sorry. I'm uh, Tyson oh. Reeves. Yeah, I know. Oh, uh, so I'll try to recap it quickly. Sure. Uh, you mentioned uh, the need to be consistently, um, consistently integr uh, integ sorry, being consistent in your integrity. Yep. Uh, but also as um, advisors and counselors and communicators, we are called upon to kind of conduct business as usual. So how would you advise us to advise our clients um, in balancing the two and, and knowing that they do have um, KPIs that they need to meet, that they do have milestones that they need to um, honor, and then even when you look at something from like an ERG standpoint, knowing that people want opportunities to celebrate and to take their mind away from things that are challenging, how would you advise us to help strike that balance? Well, so especially times like this? I, I think Tyson, that's your name, Tyson, right? Is asking like the $64,000 question, as they say. Like, you, I, I get from having been a CEO in business before I took this job, like I wanted to focus on you know, shipping product and meeting my revenue numbers, right, and exceeding goal, not on the issue du jour. Um, so I think it is, you know, as I think Oliver Wendell Holmes, the Supreme Court Justice, said about a different issue, you know it when you see it. I think you've got to work with your CEOs to trust your gut about when is the moment when it really matters and you speak up. But I think you have to resist the temptation to speak up about every issue and every cause. You just can't do it. Again, it is distracting. Your, your, your shareholders or your board don't have you there to be an activist. They have you there to be a chief executive. Now again, chief executives are trusted in a way that other institutions aren't, so you do have to show up, but you've really got to pick and choose your spots. And when you don't, forgetting the fact that it dilutes the potency of your voice, it takes your eye off the ball. So Tyson, I don't think that's a hard and fast rule, except pick your spots carefully. Tyson, one other little observation. We found in our research in September that deskless workers, in other words, factory floor people, et cetera, have substantially lower trust in their corporation. 
What's the solution? The CEO's got to get out from behind the desk and go and see people on the floor and walk the floor and talk to people and listen and learn. It's a major important to do. This is a very good point. Like I worked for Howard Schultz and uh, when he was running Starbucks and this was his approach. Like he quote managed by walking around, not just walking around the office, although he did that a lot. He'd get in at seven in the morning <laughs> and he would walk the floor to see who was it's there. All true. He was always the first one in. It was very intimidating. <laughs> and then he would travel the country and just visit stores all the time and just show up places. And boy, store checks and stuff, it makes a big difference. And he built a lot of trust over many years because he did that. Catherine? Thank you. The sound man told me to wait for the mic. Uh, Catherine Blades, my dog's name is Beignet. He has a hashtag. He's trending and he's super cute. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> November 5th, 2024 is a big day. It is our first time we will be going to the polls and we being 70% of the world to vote during the disinformation demic. Yeah. Generative AI, it's our first generative AI election. So how are you counseling the people that you counsel on how to get in front of what's gonna happen next? You talk about a tsunami, this is definitely it. You go first. Oh, you go first, actually. So we had this discussion at dinner last night with our senior team in DC about use of, of generative AI, which is I think an important uh, part of our arsenal in quality, quick response, you know, in fact, it enables us to do 7,000 pieces of, of content for Microsoft and Xbox where before we could do 50 in a month. Um, that said, what I mentioned about disinformation and feeding garbage into machine, enabling bad stuff to come out, we have to be much, much more careful about our editing process and have multiple levels of review um, before things go to client. Um, and certainly on social posts, not having anybody have the right to put stuff up without review. Some kind of, mm, is that smart or not? You'll remember a certain beer company had a problem over the summer. Um, careful. <laughs> I think that's right. I mean, we're very worried about GAI. I mean, Gen AI is going to be very problematic in terms of fighting hate. And this issue more broadly of synthetic content, whether it's, you know, deep fakes or photoshopped images or uh, just, again, synthetic like text like Richard's talking about. I don't think there's a hard and fast rule, but I think we all need to be buckled down and prepared for it. I mean, my wife, Claudia, as you know, we know her, um, is working on um, bias because Latinos um, are inherently not considered in the Gen AI universe as much as their 65 million presence would indicate, which you know. Um, and that's a matter of making sure that the content that the machine is absorbing is in equal parts the diversity of the country and of the world. It's not a perfect answer, but it's an important mission. What other questions do we have? Madam. Um, I know you talked, oh, my name's Allison. Um, I know you talked about how companies can't speak out on every issue, but I even saw a comedy sketch the other day of companies speaking out on maybe topics that they have no business speaking out about. And do you feel that that dilutes the message of people who kind of should have a voice in those things? And what do you say um, to those people who maybe shouldn't be speaking out about certain issues because they might not be the best voice for that? Look, I deal with it. It's funny. I deal with this myself at my company. I mean, look, at the end of the day, ADL is an you know, we're a nonprofit, but I've got 500 full-time employees. I have 700, 750 part-time employees or independent contractors. I've got a, almost a $100 million budget, 25 offices. So I have my people that say, we should be speaking out, we should be speaking out. And I, I have tried to create a discipline where we literally don't jump on every bus. 
we wait and pick our spots carefully. Because I do think when you speak out about everything, number one, it dilutes your potency. Number two, then you get, you get caught when you don't speak out about an issue. You spoke out about this, but not that. So you find yourself like on this kind of hamster wheel that you can never get off of. And then thirdly, as I was saying to Tyson, I think it's distracting relative to your goals. So the answer isn't, well, then don't ever say anything. I mean, you could make that your approach. Again, Brian Armstrong, the CEO at Coinbase, he said this. He said, we are never speaking out about anything. We are focused on our business, and if you don't like it, you can leave. Jonathan Neiman, the CEO of Sweetgreen, said something similar. He said, we are not going to speak out about anything. We're just going to focus on making salads. I mean, that's an approach, but if you don't have that kind of clarity and you don't consistently apply that, you've got to really pick and choose your spots carefully. And I just don't think there's a hard and fast answer. The only thing I would say that may be material is relative to your business. So when I was at Starbucks, our focus from a CSR point of view was on A, being volunteers in the communities where we had stores. So we showed up locally in the markets that mattered. And B, what we called countries of origin, the places where we sourced our coffee from. So we did work in those places. But at the time, Starbucks wasn't taking a position on every single issue under the sun. And I think by carefully choosing our spots, it was better, it was good for the brand and it was better for our voice. So there's never been a more important time for those of us in the communications business. Please tell your clients to focus in areas where they have comparative advantage and knowledge. Stay in your swim lanes. You don't have to talk about everything, but do speak up. It is important. Jonathan, you're my hero, pal. You're mine. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, so much.